Hey guys, and welcome back to the Will Wisdom Interviews. My name's Will Wisdom. These are the Will Wisdom Interviews you're watching. That's awesome. Tonight I'm going to give not my best talk. Um, tonight, tonight's going to be my seventh best talk, even though I've only done six. But as they say, as they say, the perfect is the enemy of the good. And I think... Some good things will hopefully, probably come out of this talk. If they don't, you can give it a thumbs down. Um, if they do, you can give it a thumbs up. <clears throat> Tonight I'm going to talk... Okay, Su Susan tells me we don't have time for an intro. Ugh. So I'm going to get straight to the point. Tonight we're going to talk about the top 10 philosophical truths that have changed my life forever and made me who I am. And I learned them all when I interrupted Max Pekulik, he was on the he was on his way to a retreat, and I had him sit down with me and explain everything, everything, with a capital E to me. And he's like, uh, "Can I go now?" He kept saying, "Like, all right, is that is that is that is that enough? Can I go now?" I was like, "No, Max, explain it, explain everything to me." I have another question. And so he started by, he started, he's like, all right, fine, fine. He's like, all right, look at that plant in front of us on the table. That plant is good. That plant has goodness. That plant is good at being a plant. I was like, I, I was like, what? That plant's just a plant. Nobody notices it. He's like, look, Will. I'm going to go further. And then he just blew my mind. Do you ever... Do you ever... Um, do you ever... Talk... And think about the meaning of the words you're saying... That's a good thing to do. And when we say the plant is good, we think about the word plant, we think about the word good, but do we think about that word in the middle, is? What is it to be? And Max explained to me that God is this Ising. And it just blew my mind. And I'm like, okay, um, I'm having a little trouble getting my mind around that idea. He's like, that's, that's uh, normal because we're talking about God here. We're talking about the infinite. We're talking about being with a capital B. And as, as God says, to Moses at the burning bush, he says, Moses says, who can I say you are when I, when I go back to, to my people and tell, tell them that I, that I met you in a, in a burning bush? And God says, tell them I am who am. I am. And then later in the New Testament, in the gospel, Jesus says, I am with capital I A M. And that, that, that makes the Pharisees want to stone him and arrest him and kill him because th that's blasphemy. That, that means Jesus is saying he's God because they know that God is who is and that um, Jesus is saying he's God. So... <laughs> God is, with a capital I-S, 
God is this ising. So those were two kind two two main ideas that Max explained to me when I interrupted him on his way out the door. Um, very much to his annoyment. But I benefited forever because now I have the secrets. I know. Um, and I've taken those secrets with me, and now I'm sharing them with y'all. Um, so to go along with that, God, God is goodness. God is goodness itself. God is the greatest good. Um, God is the source of all goodness. The plant gets its plantness from God. What makes it a plant? And a plant, even just a plant, is a living being. And its being goes beyond its physical makeup. It also has to do with the movement within it the the patterns the nature the nature it has um <clears throat> so think about that next time you're eating a blt now today i have notes so we don't have to rely on my mind because i have notes so to go to see, see, so to go along with that idea, to, to expand on that, we just talked about how a plant has a certain nature. Um, in the world, and I, I read this in a, a book called Guide for the Perplexed, which my friend Kevin Carenti was showing me when we lived in the Upper East Side in New York City. Um, and it explains that in the world, there are levels of life, levels of being, so to speak. And it begins at the bottom with rocks, inanimate objects. They have being, but they're not alive. Now above them are like plants. And plants are alive. They have a certain type of a soul, you can say, in a philosophical sense. Um, <clears throat> so I guess rocks or inanimate objects are their, I think this is true, they are their material makeup. Um, I'm not sure about that. But um, I don't know, I'm thinking of a chair now and a chair has certain characteristics that make it a chair that have to not only do with the material makeup but also the idea of a chair um, that makes it a chair. We know that there's lots of different types of chairs, but they're all chairs according to the definition of chair, which is basically something that you sit on. Um, anyway, going forward or upward, the next level of life is animals. And animals have, oh, by the way, by the way, just a little caveat here couple things to keep in mind as I'm talking. One, and this is very important, I have no idea what I'm talking about. And two, this is equally important, listen to me. So animals are above plants on the level of, of life, and animals have uh, a type of consciousness, at least higher up animals do. Even a fly has some type of consciousness. I don't know what I'm talking about. Not in the way a human being is conscious, but in the way an animal is conscious. Uh, it has a brain, 
um, it has like functions and it has personality um, like a dog um, it doesn't really it doesn't think really but it gets angry when it's hungry and it barks when it wants to protect a house or something or these are all subjects that can be discussed further I'm just covering the basics here and then okay above animals what happened as we all know is that a big black brick appeared from out of nowhere and we don't know what the heck it is and the big black brick stood in front of the apes and the apes all touched it and and got got this they they, they like they like touched it and the energy the energy was like sparking them and then and then they went to sleep as usual and then the next morning as we all know the ape was playing with its playing with the bones playing with the bones like it usually does and then it has the aha moment as it's hitting the bones with the bone it pictures the the antelope and it realizes it can use this bone as a tool and that was as as we all know the dawn of man and it's interesting com to compare them the film 2001 a space odyssey with the book of Genesis um, as it says in Genesis male and female he created them in the divine image he made them so God and and we all know that that famous picture in the Sistine Chapel of of God the Father touching fingers with Adam giving him the divine spark and that includes intelligence and human intelligence is very unique um, um, it enables us to possess ideas in a unique way um, so we we can pick we can you we can, this this intelligence one thing it enables us to do is to make and use tools for some purpose which which makes work vastly easier it multiplies work it multiplies the work done with the same amount of effort and this is a very profound spiritual reality that human beings can grasp and use that other animals can't although i did see on wgbh a, a claim that some birds are extremely intelligent and actually make like little hooks on the end of sticks to to catch prey or something i think it was an attempt at saying that human intelligence is not unique Animals can be quite intelligent, but still, human beings are have a vastly higher and unique set-apart intelligence that enables us to possess ideas in an infinite way and to know things. Um, this ultimately serves the purpose of us and being able to know God and and to love God, because you can't love what you don't know. Um, so human beings are, as I, as I wrote in my diagram here, um, rocks, plants, animals, humans. Then we have angels, and then we have God himself, who is the Word, with a capital W. And... Um, That's that's the end of that discussion. Um, here's another philosophical truth that, well, it's not the end of the discussion. It's the end of my covering of that topic for now. Um, another one of the most profound and life-changing truths 
I ever learned was that truth is objective and truth exists and truth is what it is no matter what our opinion of it is. Um, a lot of people are confused these days because they don't know how to grasp truth and so they give up on it. Um, people think, well, truth depends on on uh, who you ask or or what you think it is or or that it changes. Um, no, the apple is red. It's not green, even if you think, even if you're colorblind and it, it looks green to you, that's because you're colorblind. The apple is red. One plus one equals two, two plus two equals four. Mathematics is a great example of the objectivity of truth. Um, and I think this is something that Aristotle was explaining to Nicomachus in the Nico Nicomachean Ethics. Uh, I might be pulling that out of my um, <clears throat> under underarm. Um, Nicomachus was a mathematician, and actually, I think it's in it's he himself who explains that mathematics is a great example of the objectivity of truth. Anyway, again, I don't know what I'm talking about. Um, this brings us to one of the greatest philosophical truths that, that has changed my life. And this is the, the harmony of faith and reason. Um, and the, this is, this is how we can know the truth is through a combination of faith and reason. It's not one, it's not the other, it's both together. And as John Paul II um, said in his encyclical on the matter of faith and reason, on their relationship, um, faith and reason are like two wings by which the human soul ascends to the truth. Um, the soul having the intellect and the will um, so philosophy can get us pretty, pretty far towards the truth through philosophy. We can, we can learn about the soul. We can learn about virtue. We can, we can even learn about, we can learn, even learn some things about God. Um, St. Thomas Aquinas had his famous for famous in the Christian world um, proofs of the existence of God. Things like existence, um, the sustaining of existence, movement in time. Um, these are things that we can look at and with our reason come to understand that God exists and he's keeping us in existence, he's running the show. Um, when you when you look at a car traveling down the highway, you can think, well, is it is it the movement that keeps time going, or is it the time that allows the car to move? Because if time stopped, the car would stop, and if the car stopped, its time would stop, and yet they both keep going. And this is a miracle, my friends. Um, <clears throat> think about it. So next on my list of philosophical truths that have changed my life and how I see the world. So this is like getting a, a, a deep look into my mind of what I'm thinking when I'm standing there with a beer at a party. Um, Natural law is the idea that whether, whether or not God exists, there are certain laws of, of nature that, that, um, that we, can't, we can't escape. 
Um, we all know that in the world there's people of all sorts of faiths, philosophies, and ways of life. But we all stop at red lights, right? If we didn't stop at red lights, we couldn't, we couldn't function as a society. We'd all crash. We'd get nowhere. Um, I think traffic lights are a great example of the universality of, of truth and the natural law. Um, also, for instance, say you love, you love gumballs. You love, you love how they taste. You like to chew on gumballs. Let's say you want to experience the maximum pleasure you can. So you stuff gumballs in your face, right? Well, at a certain point, you, you can't put another gumball in without choking. So that's another example of natural law. Um, here's kind of a, a, a way different example of a philosophical truth, so to speak. I asked my friend Kevin, what's the relationship between being and doing? And he said, I don't know, I'm not a philosopher. I mean, Kevin was, was and is, I haven't seen him for a while, a great thinker. He read a lot of books. He liked to contemplate the higher things as, uh, um, as his, his book liked to say. Um, the higher things, the higher truths, the higher goodnesses, the higher beauties, ultimately God and everything that comes from him, truth, beauty, goodness. Um, but he said, I don't know, I'm not a philosopher. And um, that was striking to me, that, that humility, that simplicity. And I think that's important to keep in mind. Um, on that note, just yesterday, I was having a rough day, partly because I was overwhelmed with my inability to penetrate into the higher things. And so Debbie sent me two dinosaurs via text. The first dinosaur, his brain was exploding or his mind was exploding and then the second one had hearts in his eyes in other words sometimes you just have to let it go and say okay i can't understand everything and the answer is love and that's what jesus talks about is how we the bottom line is we need to love god and love one another um salvation is not based on how much you know, but how much you love. Um, although he also does say, what is the greatest law? Well, to love God with your whole, your all your strength, all your heart, all your being, and all your mind. So we do want to use our minds, but Jesus talks a lot more about the heart. Um... So kind of to expand on the idea of faith and reason, um, philosophy, philosophy is the handmaid of theology, and philosophy is pursuit of truth starting at the bottom, starting from I know nothing, and gradually ascending towards the truth. And again, in this world today, in society, there's a rumor that we can't know anything. You know, professors at universities teach that with all their heart as doctrine, like you can't know anything. The truth is there is no truth. Well, if you think about that statement, as Peter Kreeft says in his book, The Journey, um, well, if the truth is there is no truth, if that is the truth, then that is a contradiction. That's a contradictory statement. So there has to be a truth. Um, so anyway, philosophy is building from the ground up. Um, as John Paul II explains, 
always with respect for the possibility that we're wrong. So with humility, but also with hope, ascending to the truth. And gradually, after we ask questions over and over and over again and ponder them day after day, when we start to always come up with the same answers, we know we're on to something. And we can say with a nugget of faith, okay, this is true. Um, on the other hand, when we're talking about faith, that's like beginning from the, the top. Well, there is no top really because God is infinite, but let's just say the ceiling coming down, that's revelation. And that is a big help to us because it allows us to get higher than we could ever get on our own, with our own power, with our own intelligence. Um, and where do they meet? Well, they, they meet somewhere, they meet somewhere in the middle. Faith, faith and reason always go together. They always coincide. Um, think of a scientist doing research on diseases. He uses faith in a number of ways. First of all, he uses faith in deciding which experiments to do, how to spend his money, where to put his efforts, who to hire. Um, and then when he, after the, after the, the data comes in, he looks at it and he, he, he makes some conclusions and this is science, but it's all, there's also, there's also faith involved. There's also some faith, faith and intuition involved in saying, okay, this theory is true or this theory is false. Next, I'm going to talk about a interesting topic, which is, uh, I don't know, complicated. Um, and that is the relationship between the mind and the heart. Um, which is one of my favorite topics. Um, Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 says, Trust not your own intelligence. Uh, um, on the other hand, I was once advised it when, when choosing a wife or a girlfriend who to date, um, not to go with my heart, but to go but to follow my mind in making that sort of a decision, or at least to rule people out with my mind. And I found that difficult to accept. It's very counterintuitive. Um, and I still don't know what to think about that. But it was certainly profound and different from what you usually hear. Um, a friend of mine, however, advised me when I was talking to her about whether I should follow my mind or follow my heart. She said, um, it, actually, it actually depends on who, who the person is that's making the decision and, and um, what the situation is. She said, a lot of people out there need to follow their mind, need to listen to their mind more, their intelligence, their conscience more. She said, but for you, you're an overthinker, so you need to follow your heart. And I thought that was very wise. My mother has said, well, why do the mind and heart have to disagree? Don't they always agree? Well, in the end, hopefully they do agree, and I think they do because God is truth and God is love and God is one. So truth and love are one. And divine love and human love are one. But on earth, it can be a little bit complicated and not always seem so. But anyway, for, for some people, following their mind and following their heart is the same thing. And, and I, I think that, that I love the truth, so my heart will lead me to truth. And what else? I don't know what to say. I, 
I will know love. Um, so we pray, we pray, um, Lord, that I may see. We pray for wisdom and we pray, Lord, that it may be. Thy will be done, Father, thy will be done. Um, expanding on this, this idea of faith and reason again, um, a priest I know, Father Dave, once said in a homily as a joke, fire, ready, aim, implying, saying that, well, before we make decisions, we need to think about what we're doing. And there's another interesting saying, which is quoted at the beginning of the film, Run, Lola, Run, Nach dem Spiel ist vor dem Spiel, which means after the game is before the game. So the result, the result comes from contemplation before the game. And we see her, Lola, doing this at the beginning of the movie when she's frantically thinking, okay, who should I call to ask for money? And then depending on what she thinks in the three different uh, sequences, which are interpretable, um, we see different results according to who she decided to ask for money, although to save her friend. But who she decided to go ask for money didn't exactly correspond with anything particularly wise or not wise. It just happened, so I don't know. But that's the movie Run, Lola, Run. Very good movie. Highly recommended. So, on the other hand, in, a, in opposition to the idea of fire, ready, aim, we have the idea of, well, that's actually not so silly. Because sometimes acting without completely understanding yields the vision we sought in the first place. And... A priest at St. Clement's, Father Sean, was talking about this in his homily the other day, how, well, the Pharisees were asking Jesus for signs, for sign, and, and Jesus was saying, I'm not going to give you any signs. Look, I already gave you the sign of Jonas, and I already, I already gave you um, I don't know, uh, the sign of, of Solomon, and and there's greater something greater here. Um, I don't know if that's the same gospel. Anyway, they were looking for signs, but the, the truth is that no matter how many, he was performing miracles in front of their face. What else did they want? They could keep asking and asking and asking for signs ad infinitum, but they weren't going to believe. So sometimes... But on the other hand, it's the people it's the people that make that leap and believe who then sudden who then are able to suddenly see signs all around them. Um, let me see if there's anything else to talk about. All right, um, I've mentioned this before in one or more of my other talks, and this is an important philosophical, actually theological um, truth that has shaped the way I see the world, and that is that I believe that the Catholic religion has the fullness of truth, And that's an important idea. It's not we're right and you're wrong. It's you're right, but we're righter than you. <laughs> and I think this is a, a great solution to that riddle of are all religions true or are all religions not true? Are all religions the same? Well, think about this. Either Jesus is God or he's not. So, you know, Islam and, and Judaism, 
may have a lot of the truth. They may have a lot of wisdom, and I believe they do. But either Jesus is God or he's not. And if he's not, then these people are off base claiming to persist and, you know, embrace embrace their faith as as the 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 way to live. There's more out there, and that's the fact that God became a man and and nobody noticed. Um and there's a lot of evidence and a lot of reasons to believe in him. Um, as, as Father Peter at St. Saint, Saint Clement said, um, we all want reasons to believe. Well, there are a lot of good reasons to believe, um, to believe in God, to believe in Jesus, to believe that Jesus is God, and to believe that the church is his bride. Um, So, I'm just going to do one or two more, more, more points of things that, I've, that have changed my life as far as truth goes. Um, when everything gets complicated and I'm, I'm down about um, life and whether it's intellectual life or it's regular life. Um, oh, I'll throw this in there. In that regard, the relationship between life and the intellectual life, which is the, the mental pursuit of truth, um, using our intelligence and, and faith. Um, St. Thomas Aquinas said something very interesting. He said, happiness is the contemplation of truth. And that, that deeply changed the way I go about my life um, because that made me say, okay, it's, it's okay to spend my life in my apartment reading books and making talks in front of two really cool light boards. Um, because why? Why? Because truth is good for its own sake. Yes, truth allows us to do things and it allows us to love God and to love one another. And this is an essential part of truth. But truth is also good for its own sake. It glorifies God to, to ponder his mysteries, to contemplate his mysteries, and to grow in knowledge and wisdom of him um, with his grace. On the other hand, St. Thomas Aquinas also said, in my enthusiastic pursuit of truth, let me not forget the truth of God's love. So they go together, truth and love. Um, so revelation reveals the full extent of God's goodness with a capital G, because God is not only the greatest good, but God is goodness itself. And so anything that is good ultimately comes from God. Um, often through his creation, often through men and women. Um, we share in the creative power of God the Father. And that is an amazing thing. Um, we are an extent of his creation. We continue his creation. Um, when I am in the bathroom and I wash my hands with warm water after a long depressing day or a, or a confusing day, a frustrating day, when I'm, when I'm boggled down by the sorrows of life and people not being nice to me and, and people not making sense, I, I wash my hands under the warm water and I feel the warmth and I say, God is good. Because anything good is a reminder of God's infinite goodness. 
and that it's all going to be okay. It's going to, we're going to have a happy ending. And I do that in other ways too. Um, I'm going to read a quote, which somehow relates to things I've been talking about. I actually don't remember how because I didn't write the quote down. I just wrote the verse. So we're going to find out together what this quote is. But I think it has to do with wisdom. Um, all right. So from the first book of St. Paul's letter to the Corinthians, chapter 1, Where is the wise one? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made the wisdom of the world foolish? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not come to know God through wisdom. It was the will of God through the foolishness of the proclamation to save those who have faith. For Jews demand signs and Greeks look for wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are called, Jews and Greeks alike, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. So, what we can get out of that is summarized by a statement my dad made which is that Christianity is not primarily an intellectual pursuit because Christianity is about love, the love of God and our love back to God and our love of our neighbor with God's love. Um, and that whole, that whole um, passage from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18, through chapter 2, the end of chapter 2, is quite amazing. But I think I'll cover that maybe more in depth another day, but I recommend you read it, and I'll put it in the references in the description of this video. It talks about the relationship between human wisdom and divine wisdom. And basically, divine wisdom is foolishness to human beings. We think it's foolish. So who's more reasonable, God or men? Well, sometimes men have the, men have the uh, mistake of taking their reason too seriously. And God just laughs at us. He makes, he makes a mockery of us with his wisdom. Um, so that, and it also talks about the relationship between, um, human weakness and God's power, God's strength, which is a, a related topic. Uh, and here it's being partly applied to the intellectual life and the pursuit of truth and wisdom. So, that's about all we have for today, my friends. Susan, can I do a conclusion at least? Um, yeah, so, my friends, my conglomerates, my esteemed colleagues, thank you for listening um, these are the Will Wisdom interviews. I'm Will Wisdom, you're watching, and that's awesome.